Good morning, everybody. We are so glad you're here with us today. We encourage you to join in with us and worship with us as our worship team leads us. They're getting ready right now, so we are uh, going to pray and enter into worship together. Father, we are so grateful for the opportunity to join together. Although it might not be together, Lord, we're together in spirit, and we're together as people united with one heart and with one voice. And Lord, as we worship you together, would you just fill our homes and our rooms with your presence as we worship you this morning? And would you help us to be receptive to the, to the word this morning? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing in the middle of a storm
the battle's already been won. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We declare this morning that you are victorious. You are victorious, oh God. Lord, we are so thankful that in the presence of our enemies, you set up a banquet table. And Lord, we are thankful that even though we are going through this pandemic, that we can take confidence in knowing that you are a God who supplies and meets all of our needs. And so Lord, we lift up those needs to you this morning collectively in our homes and in our rooms. Lord, wherever we're watching this, this stream from, Lord, we lift those up to you with confidence knowing that we can count on you, we can trust you, and it doesn't matter what we face, you will always be there for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, we have moderators who are moderating this service and they want to hear from you. So if you do have a prayer request, we just ask that you please drop it in those comments and we'll be able to pray with you and one of them will be able to pray with you and reach out to you during this service. We are so glad you're with us today. Um, if you are watching, maybe for the first time, go ahead and let us know that too and who you're watching with. We love to hear from you in the comment sections of these videos. I'm so glad that you're here and we're going to take a moment and celebrate and give together. You know, the scripture says that we are to give cheerfully for the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And one of these things that the pandemic is doing in our lives, I notice that he's starting to rob us of our joy and our celebration of giving. And so friends, whether you're giving online or whether you're sending it in here to the campus or whether you're dropping it off or however you choose to give in this time, we just ask and I just ask that we together as a church remember that the Lord loves when we are cheerful as we give. So when we're on campus, we celebrate. We take a moment when one of us is on the platform and we take a moment and we celebrate and we clap and we cheer. Do that in your homes during this time. Celebrate that we get the opportunity to give together and to continue our worship in this way. It's always a great opportunity that we have to worship with our finances and it's always an exciting time. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to give. And Lord, we give cheerfully. Lord, we don't we don't give um, downcast. We don't give in a sad way. But Lord, we are so excited wherever we're giving from this morning. We are excited that we get the opportunity to give and to bring back the tithe, which is the first 10%, and also go above and beyond to bless missionaries. The Lord, when we think about what the expanse is of what this giving and what our gifts go towards, Lord, Lord I just pray pray that you would help us to have that eternal perspective and understand that we can get excited about knowing that our giving extends our church and our, our ministries here and the gospel, most importantly, all over the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Uh, thank you for joining us on this wonderful Sunday morning as we continue to worship our God by gathering together across our community in our homes with our families, connecting in the spirit. I want to thank you for joining us. This is our last uh, message in the series of 
of the statements of Jesus, the I am statements of Jesus. Uh, if you missed any of the previous ones, I want to encourage you just to go on our YouTube channel or our website. If you haven't downloaded the Play Me First app, you can download that and, uh, and catch up on them. Again, the whole, the whole purpose of the I am statements of Jesus is to reveal who he is and how he relates to us as his people. And every one of those I am statements speak of, of the greatness of our God and, uh, and also how incredibly loving he is to us every, every second and every moment of our lives. I want to just, before we get into the word today, I want to just say how extremely proud I am of our church family. You know, this has been a very difficult and uh, a very different time for all of us. And yet, uh, I, can't, I can't help but be blessed and encouraged But when I see how our church family has responded to this. You have stayed connected with one another. Our connect groups are are meeting through our Zoom uh, technology. Um, you have uh, stepped up to the plate and helped out in any way you can. You've taken it upon yourself to be a blessing to the community. I love that because that's who you are. You are the church and you are being a blessing. Just last uh, couple weeks ago, we were able to just put out a word um, about blessing those that are truckers, that they've been going at it 24 hours a day and nonstop almost, and, and many of them haven't had time to stop for, for e to even eat lunch. And so you guys, we put our word out, and you inundated us with all kinds of things that we were able to bless our truckers with, and, uh, and that was an amazing thing. Some of you r went right away and started sewing masks and, our, and, our, and blessed our UPS drivers and blessed other in the medical community. Uh, you know, the Easter Saturday, uh, uh, you guys decided to put together a parade and just drove through town honking your horns with signs and, and just declaring the fact that Jesus was alive. Just one thing after another that as your pastor, I just want to say how blessed and encouraged I am that you have stepped up and, and, and really show what the church is supposed to be. And so thank you for that. You've been an encouragement to, to me personally, but you've been an encouragement to all of us as well. Well, let's go ahead and finish up our I am statements. And today what I want to do is I want to look at the I am statement of Jesus. And you can read about it in John chapter 15. If you want to turn there, if you have your Bibles open, you can. The 15th chapter of, of John. And, and let me just say this. This is such an important statement. All of them are, but this one here, I believe personally, if we if we understand this statement and adhere uh, to this statement and really take it in and and follow through on it, it is the one statement that keeps all the other I am statements of Jesus relevant in our life. If we don't do this I am statement, the other ones will begin to fade away and we will not be the recipients of, of, of all the blessings that God wants to give us through the fact of who he is, okay? So let me just give you a quick background here. In John chapter 15, Jesus has had his last supper with his, his uh, disciples, and uh, he established a new covenant in his blood, and, uh, and, they move, and they're on their way to Gethsemane. And somewhere in between there, we're not real sure, he stops and he, and he shares chap, John chapter 14 and 15 and 16 and 17. And, and it's just an incredible portion of scripture to show the last words of Jesus before he became the sacrifice that you and I, I need so desperately. And so these are words of Christ uh, and the last I am statement that he gives to his disciples and to us. And, and obviously we all know that the last words of someone on this earth are very important and uh, this one is no different. So let's go ahead and read in John chapter 15, beginning in verse number one. Jesus says this, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. Now, let me just stop there. He's the true vine, which means that there are false vines. That implies there are false vines. And too often we find people that are attaching themselves uh, to something that is really not a, a giving of, of life. There's no life in it. There's, it's not a true vine. There's also false teachers that we have to be aware of as well. Jesus says, listen, there's a lot of vines out there, but I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So he's speaking to his to people of God. He's speaking to believers, to the followers of Jesus Christ. That's you and I. Verse four, 
this is, this is where it starts, okay? This is what I want you to understand. And I want you to see the key word in, in all of these verses. It's just uh, another just another few verses, but I want you to see the key word. You, you, can't, you can't miss it. Verse number four, the first word, remain. Some of your translations say abide, okay? Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. Verse seven, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Verse nine, as the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your amazing word, for your living word, for your life-changing word. And I pray that uh, it would make us clean today. I pray that it would encourage us. I pray that it would rebuke us. I pray that it would teach us. I pray, God, that it would change us. I pray that it would do the work that you ordained for it to do from before the very foundation of the world. I pray, oh God, that we would have ready hearts to receive and allow it to bear the fruit that you wanted to bear in our lives. God, I pray that this word would become flesh through us and I prayed in Jesus' name, amen. You know, many of you know that I, I grew up in South Florida and, uh, you know, I, was about, I lived about 10 minutes, 15 minutes away from, from the beach, you know, most of my, uh, my life. And so when I was about 15 years old, my older brother invited me to, to join him and we, want, we wanted to get certified for scuba diving, right? And so we did a scuba certification and uh, the instructor actually taught us in a pool uh, behind an apartment complex. And in that pool, he taught us how to put our masks on. He taught us how to operate the oxygen tanks, right? And he taught us what would happen, uh, how to respond if we were underwater and our tank, our gas, our, uh, our oxygen tank would, would cease to function and how we would never dive by ourselves. We'd always have to have a buddy with us, right? And uh, he taught us when we were under the water, he made us take off our oxygen and to share with the person who still had oxygen. And so there's just the thought of losing your oxygen when you are underwater. And so the first time that that we went out to the actual ocean and, and went diving. Uh, I remember being under there. Again, I'm with my buddy and we're down and the instructor is there, everybody's there, but we're underwater and we're going down 15 feet, 20 feet. And I, I remember distinctly, because there's a, a, there's a gauge on it, and I just kept looking at my gauge, making sure that I had enough oxygen. Just the thought of, of, I mean, I'm not a panicky guy, but I kind of panicked a little bit when I looked and I saw that the oxygen levels were getting lower and lower and lower, and I didn't know how much longer they wanted us to stay under there. Obviously, he pulled us out before it ran out. But under that water, if you're not connected to your oxygen, uh, let me just say it's not a good thing, right? I also, as I was studying this, this passage this week, I thought about those individuals, and I've had to through the years, as a minister of the gospel, had to pray with, with many people who have had to make the difficult decision of whether or not to, to keep a loved one on a ventilator when the doctors have said there is no more hope and, and whether or not they are to detach them from that life support. And, and it's a difficult, so difficult matter because you know and they know that the moment they detach that oxygen from that loved one, it's just a matter of time before they 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 pass on from this life to the next and 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 I couldn't help but think of those two situations one a more serious one than the other but but I couldn't help but think of of our connection to a life source 
In this matter, it was oxygen. We need oxygen to breathe, to live. And Jesus says, as a matter of fact, he says, I am the vine. I am your source of life. I am your nutrition, right? And you're just a branch. A branch doesn't have life in its own. You need to be connected to the source of life if you're going to live. And he says, you need to remain in me. And you saw how many times we read that. Again, some of your translation says live or abide. And, and so what I'm going to do is I, on the screen, you're going to see the definition of this remain, which is translated in, in the NIV remain, right? The Greek verb for it is meno. And meno means this, to continually. It's, it's a constant deal. It's not a one-time deal and you stop. No, it's to continually abide to continually stay, to stand, to continually dwell or live in, to remain. And so my paraphrase of what Jesus is saying here when he said, I am the vine and you are the branches, remain in me is this. And again, it's on your screen. But my paraphrase is this, to stay or remain vitally connected in loving fellowship with Christ. What, what he's talking about here is a real vital, intimate relationship with the Lord, with himself, with Jesus, right? And so the question that I had to ask myself as, as I study this is, do I value my connection to Jesus with the same urgency and importance that I did to my oxygen tank when I was 20 feet in, un, under the ocean surface? Do I look at my relationship with Jesus as something that I need desperately in my life? You see, some of you are watching today, and Jesus is just someone that you know about. He's still someone you know about. You know that he died on a cross. You know he was born of a virgin. You know that he rose again from the dead. You know these truths. You know them. Maybe you learned them in a catechism class or, or you learned them from, from a mom or a dad or a grandma. And, and you know about Jesus. I, I knew about Jesus for a long time before I actually really got to know Jesus and got connected to him in relationship in a vital, life-giving relationship. For some of you, you know Jesus personally. You're connected, but he's more of a weakened acquaintance that you connect with on Sundays. And the rest of the week, you forget completely about him. And so, and so here's the one truth that I am going to reiterate throughout this message that I really want, I, you can forget everything else, but I don't want you to forget this one truth. This is the vital truth that I believe Jesus was saying and teaching us and we need to walk away with today. I wrote this down when I was studying this passage and that's this, staying connected to Jesus is not an option, it's a necessity. Just like staying connected to my oxygen level when I was 20 feet, 15 feet under the ocean surface was not an option. It's a necessity. Our connection, our abiding, our remaining connected to Jesus is not an, it's not an option, folks. It's a necessity. And so what we're going to do today is this. We're going to, we're going to break down this passage, right? And we're going to look at what Jesus taught us are the, some of the consequences of disconnecting from him, right? Then we're going to see the benefits of remaining and staying connected to him. And then we're going to finish up with three principles, very practical principles on how we, as followers of Jesus Christ, can stay connected to him, how we can remain in him. How can we remain in him? So again, I want to just reiterate the big idea that I want you to walk away with today. And I, I want you to say this with me, right? I want you to say this. It's on the screens. Staying connected to Jesus is not an option. It's what, church? What is it? It's a necessity. It's a necessity. This is the point he was making. And his words actually give a warning as well as a promise. So his words are words of warning as well as promise. The warning is if you disconnect or you never connect, there are eternal consequences. There are dire consequences, negative consequences. But if you connect and remain connected, abiding with him, in him, remaining in him, living and dwelling in him, in union with him, 
then, then you will experience some very positive and eternal benefits. That's the promise. So I want to look at the consequences first, real quick. And so the first thing, if I, if I don't stay connected to him, this is what Jesus says. He says, I will live a fruitless life. I will live a fruitless life. He says, remain in me, verse 4, as I also remain in you. He, is, he wants to remain in us. He remains in us. It's our job to remain in him, right? No branch, and that's what we are, can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now, in spiritual terms, when we read this, this bear fruit, when Jesus is speaking of bearing fruit, what he's meaning is this. He's, he's talking about an outward evidence of what's happening inside you. It's, it's the outward evidence of true inward faith. We're, we're talking about the, the visible growth that we experience when we're connected to Jesus in, in character, in compassion, and in, in godly behavior that will lead to actions that will advance the kingdom of God. And Paul lists some of those fruits and he looks, he says, this is what the fruit is going to look like in your life. When, it, when we're talking about character, this is what he says it's going to look like in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. He says, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. Just reading those words just does something to my spirit, just does something. It brings a calmness to my, to my soul. And, and I cannot imagine, and neither, you probably can't imagine your life without joy, without peace, without goodness, without love. And here's the deal. This, these verses perfectly describe the Lord Jesus himself. It's the character of Christ that he's talking about here. And it's the character of Christ that will be produced in our lives if we stay connected to Jesus. And the opposite is true. If we disconnect, that character can never be reproduced in your life and mine. So I'm going to say it again. Staying connected to Jesus is not an option. It's a necessity. So if we don't stay connected we live, live a fruitless life. Here's the second thing. The other consequences is I will accomplish nothing significant. I will accomplish nothing significant. He says this, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And, and check it out. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. He doesn't say you can do some things. He can't say, well, there's a couple things you can, but no, no. He makes it black and white. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And what is he talking about? He's talking about the kind of things that have eternal significance. You know, every one of us, down deep inside, we want to live a life that matters. We want to have a lasting impact in this world that we live in. We want to do something of significance in our lives. We want to leave a legacy of some kind that says, she made an impact, he made an impact in my life. Now, Jesus is specifically speaking of the kingdom of God. He's talking about kingdom endeavors and, and kingdom achievements. Because here's the deal. The only things that will last, the only accomplishments that are truly significant, the, 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 that accumulate heavenly rewards for us, are the things that we do for the kingdom of God and for the glory of God. See, there are earthly accomplishments, and many people accomplish many things on this earth and they have their rewards but they are earthly rewards period you may get the applause of men and it ends there you may have your name written in a history book and it ends there it's an earthly accomplishment now i can't see your hand but 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 work with me okay i want you to raise your hand if you have heard and know who Irving Morrow is. Raise your hand if you know who Irving Morrow is. Now, I can't see you, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that the majority of you, unless you're a history buff, don't know who Irving Morrow is. But Irving Morrow is the, is the architect. He is the one who designed the Golden Gate Bridge, which is one of the seven wonders of the modern world. Earthly accomplishment. Now raise your hand if you have ever heard of Billy Graham. 
Now, again, I can't see your hand, but, but I'm pretty sure that the great majority of you have heard who Billy Graham is. Earthly accomplishments versus heavenly accomplishments. Doing something and building something like a bridge, which is necessary, awesome, and preaching the gospel of Christ where millions, millions have, have come to Christ and their lives have been changed for all eternity. Jesus said, apart from him, you and I can do nothing of any eternal significance. Again, staying connected to Jesus is not an option. It's a what? It's a necessity, church. Here's the third thing he says and he teaches us about disconnecting from and if we're not staying connected, if we don't stay connected, if I don't stay connected to him, I will die spiritually. I'll die spiritually. Verse six, he says, if you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers and such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. Now, I read that, and, and I've read it many, many times. And here's one thing that I, that I came to the realization is that this is not something that happens overnight. It doesn't happen immediately. It doesn't happen easily. The branch of a tree does not wither in a day. What happens is that that branch is disconnected from the vine, from the nutrients. And little by little, slowly but surely, the process of withering begins and if there is no reconnection, the graphing to it, the withering is going to continue until it becomes complete and the branch dies. And once the branch dies, it doesn't matter how much you try. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't work anymore. There's, it's dead, right? And Jesus said, all you can do with it at that point is throw it in the garbage heap, right? Burn it. And it's the same thing with us spiritually. See, spiritual withering is also a very slow process. And it's so slow at times that sometimes it's even unnoticeable. It's an unnoticeable process of slowly disconnecting from our relationship with Christ. That, that's when things of God, when the things of God begin to lose their appeal. And not only do you begin to lose the appeal of the things of God, but now the things of the world begin to gain appeal in our lives and you find yourself losing all interest in Christ and and the kingdom of God and the things of God and the people of God and you wither and wither until all that's left is this deadness to the things of God and again it's a process it's a it's a slow fade it's a it's a drifting away the, the book of Hebrews explains it and says it that way. I, I can't help but think of, of the one picture on this earth that we have of Christ and his church, and that's marriage. The Bible's very clear that marriage on this earth is supposed to reflect the relationship that Jesus has with his church. And when you look at a marriage, they, it starts by making vows to each other and they enter into covenant a man and a woman enters into covenant with each other. And, uh, and that's marriage. It's, it's happened. There's, there's, there's a connection there. And what keeps that connection alive, what keeps that connection growing is, is as they continue to commune together and, and they continue to communicate and, and there's an intimacy that they work on and husband and wife work on and, and it helps to continually grow in that relationship and grow in their love with each other and, and, and a love that was fleeting and romantic becomes a, a, a mature, deep-seated commitment of love to one another. But in the same way, if they stop communing and they stop communicating and, and there's no intimacy involved, then slowly they begin to drift apart and, and, they, and their life begins to wither. Their love for each other begins to wither and, 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 and something dies. And unless they are reconnected through counseling or, or some kind of help, eventually something dies in that marriage. And it's no different with our relationship with Jesus. When we begin to slowly 
separate from the things of God and the things that once at, at one time meant so much to us, but now it's like, well, you know, it's an option. That withering begins. And without repentance, without turning back and reconnecting with the Lord, the only thing that's left is death. Staying connected with Jesus, friends, is not an option. It's a necessity. But there's good news. There's good news. Come on, touch somebody that's there with you and say, there's good news. There's good news. I don't have to disconnect. I can remain connected to Jesus. I can stay plugged in to the, the life source, my source, my oxygen, the, the one who keeps me growing in every aspect of life. So let's look at the benefits real quick. If I stay connected to him, Jesus says, number one, I will display much fruit. He says, if you remain in me and I in you, you will, you will bear much fruit. Now, now let me just quickly just give you several things about this fruit that, that came to my mind this week. First of all, fruit always reveals the character of a tree, right? The fruit always reflects the character of the tree. Apples come from apple trees. Oranges grow on orange trees. And, and so every time that you look at fruit, you don't have to wonder about the tree. You know where it came from. And I think that what Jesus is saying here is, listen, I, I'm, the, I'm the vine, right? I'm the tree. You're just, you're just a branch that bears the fruit. But that fruit ought to point people back to me. It ought to reflect my character. It ought to show my attitudes and actions and character and conduct, right? And that leads me to the second thing I think of is, is he says that you will bear much fruit. You will produce. And that carries the idea of being seen, of being on display. Fruit is always seen. You cannot hide fruit on a tree, right? You may not be able to see a potato as it grows, but you will always see orange. You will always see an apple. In this case, you will always see the grapes as they grow. And it gets to the point where you cannot ignore the fruit on that tree. And then one thing about fruit is this, it's, it's always for the benefit of others. I've, I've never seen a tree eating its own fruit. I, I've never seen <laughs> a vine eating its own grapes, never. Fruit is always for the benefit of someone else. And, and if we only serve ourselves instead of others, our fruit is going to rot on the tree. Imagine if a tree kept it, if it's not, if it keeps it, and says, no, I'm not giving this to anybody, and nobody picks it, it rots on the branch. And by the way, Jesus says you're going to bear fruit, but he doesn't just say bear fruit. He says you're going to bear much fruit, which means that it's abundant fruit. We're talking about not just quantity, but we're also talking about a quality that he wants people to see. He wants people to see you, to look at you and me, and see him. He is the fruit that people, that he wants people to see. And, then the, and the longer we stay in Christ, remain in Christ, the greater that, true, that fruit will be. But, but there's something that has to happen that is, that is necessary for that fruit to be healthy and, and for that fruit to grow and to be much and abundant, right? And that's this. This is a benefit as well. I will be pruned to produce better fruit. I will be pruned to produce better fruit. Look what he says in verse number two, two. He says, every branch, not some, but every branch that does, not, that does bear fruit, okay, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Now, at first, that might not seem like a benefit, right? Because I don't know about you, but pruning, when you think of what pruning is, pruning is cutting away, it's snipping away, it's painful, right? But here's the deal, it, in order for us to bear quality fruit, in order for us to bear abundance of fruit, in order for our lives to, to, to be truly significant in great ways, pruning is necessary. And, and Jesus said, listen, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and my father is the gardener. He's the one who prunes the branches not because he wants to bring pain into the branches' lives, but so that the branches will produce more 
fruit. Now, if I were to ask you how many of you want to be more fruitful, all of you would raise your hands. But if I ask you how many of you want to be pruned, when you know what pruning is, a lot of you would put your hands down. But the reality is this. Without the pruning, there is no great fruit. Without the pruning, there is no growth. And, 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 the, and Jesus says, my father himself is the one that comes alongside you and he begins to prune the branches. And here's the cool thing about this, you know, at, at that time, just n nobody could just go and start pruning the vines of, of a grapevine, the, the, uh, the branches of a grapevine. People had to go and actually learn how to do that. They had to be certified in order for them to come alongside and, and prune it just right. Because if you did it the wrong way, it would wither the entire vine. And so, and so when the father comes alongside you, he, he doesn't do it haphazardly. He knows, he knows how to take, and, and he has to get super close to the branch. In, if you've ever seen a branch of a, of a vine, uh, of a grapevine, they're delicate, you know, and he has to make sure that he's really close and he's seeing what's happening and he doesn't cut too much off and, and he cuts just enough on. And what he does is he, he does two things. Number one, he cuts out the dead wood that maybe that dead wood would bring disease or bring insects. And so there are times when he looks at our lives and he says, that should not be part of your life that's dead wood and if you leave it it's going to bring infection if you leave it it's going to bring insects if you leave it it's going to bring disease and so he'll come alongside and he'll cut away the, de the dead wood other times he will cut actual living tissue he'll cut away tissue that perhaps it's not nothing wrong with it it's not but it's sapping nutrients that could go to producing more fruit and so what he does is he cuts away some of that living tissue so that you can produce greater fruit. Sometimes he would go ahead and cut an entire, an entire uh, a, a bunch of grapes, a whole bunch of grapes, and he would cut them away so that the grapes that remain will become better, higher quality, and a greater production. Because God wants both quality and quantity. Honestly, when you look at it, pruning is an act of mercy and love. If, if, if God the Father just left us to, him, to ourselves without cutting away the dead wood, without cutting away the living tissue, <laughs> we would be a mess, friends. We'd be a mess. The greatest judgment that God could bring upon us as children of God is for him to leave us alone, for, 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 for him to let us have our own way because we'll always make a mess of it. So, so here's the thing. Here's what I've discovered in, in this world that we live in, the life that we live on this earth. When, when there's no pruning, it's going to bring pain, and there's not going to be any fruit. When there is pruning, it's going to bring pain, but there's going to be much fruit. The pain is constant. It's, it's, the, it's the common denominator, right? The question is whether we want fruit or not. And the only way we can have the fruit that God wants to produce in our lives is through the pruning. And your heavenly father is never closer to you than when he's pruning you. And sometimes he causes away that dead wood that causes all kinds of trouble in your life. And it was painful at the time, but now you look back and you say, thank you, father, for cutting that away in my life. Sometimes he cuts away the living tissue that's robbing you of some spiritual strength. It's nothing wrong with it, but you're giving so much attention to this good thing that is keeping you from the best things that he has in store for you. He doesn't want just, in, just good enough in your life. He wants the best in your life. And the longer we remain in Christ, the more fruit we're going to bear. The more fruit we bear, the more the Father's going to come alongside us to prune us so that the quality keeps up with the quantity. And you know, how does the Father prune us? I'm, let me just quickly tell you, man. Number one, Jesus said, you've been made clean through the, through the word. So one way he prunes us is when he convicts us through the word of God. How many of you have ever been convicted? You heard a message, you, you, you read the word, and man, you just kind of pricked your heart and said, man, I, I'm not living up to this. And you made a change in your life, and he prunes you through that. Honestly, that's the less painful way. <laughs> if we don't respond to that, then he disciplines us. 
The book of Hebrews chapter 12, verses five through 11 speaks about that, how, how that is evidence that he is our father and that we're sons and daughters of his. And, and none of us like to be disciplined at the time, but it always brings forth something so much better than we had before we got disciplined. Sometimes he'll prune us by allowing trials to come into our lives. And James says, listen, when those trials come, consider it pure joy because it's producing something in you. It's producing perseverance and maturity in your life. And here's a, the benefit of pruning and, and there's the benefit of, of being more fruitful. But then there's the amazing promise that he makes in verse number seven. Because if I stay connected to Jesus, I will have my prayers answered. He says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. That's an amazing, amazing promise that he makes. But, but hear what he is saying. He doesn't say, listen, if you come up with some kind of wish list, just throw it my way. Whatever you wish for, I'm going to give it to you. You know, that word that he uses there to ask is actually a word that's not just a, oh, please, God, will you give it to me? It's almost like there's a confidence that you can almost demand something from God, not in a, not in a, uh, a wrong way, always understanding that, it's, that you can't demand anything from God. It's not in an obnoxious way. It's almost in the way that, I thought about this this week. You know, you're, you're at a trial at a courtroom, right? And, and, and let's say you're the attorney uh, for the defendant and you bring about and you bring the evidence and it's, it's irrefutable evidence, right? And you show that this man is not guilty and you stand before the judge and you say, judge, based on the evidence, I demand that you declare this man non, not guilty. It's not because I hope he's not guilty. It's not because I wish, let me, give me what I wish. No, no, no. The evidence demands a non-guilty, a not guilty verdict, right? And I thought about that because what he's saying is this, if you remain in me and I remain in you, What's going to happen is this. I'm going to be, it's so, you're going to be so united with me that my thoughts are going to be your thoughts. My desires are going to be your desires. So when it comes to the point where you are asking the father of something based on the evidence, I'm remaining in him and he's remaining in me based on the evidence that God's word has declared this to me. I can say your honor, my God, based on the fact that it is God working in me, the Lord working in me. I remain in him. He remains in me based on the fact that this is the Lord's will in the name of Jesus I demand that you in your mercy and your compassion and your authority that you would grant me this request it's not based on my wish list it's based on the will of the son he says later on if you ask anything in my name in my name in my name it will be done for you what Jesus wants, I want. And if Jesus wants it, I can demand it. I can ask for it knowing that it will come my way. And staying connected with Jesus brings such an intimate union with him, such harmony with his will that you will never ask anything outside of his will. And if you ask anything according to his will, it will be given to you. Isn't that awesome? It's an incredible promise if we remain in him and he remains in us. And number four, if I stay connected to Jesus, I will prove to be Christ's disciple. He said, this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. See, Christianity is all about relationship. It's not about rules and regulations, it's about relationship. And relationships, true relationships always produce the fruit of love. And that's why in John 13, verse 35, Jesus said this. He says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So the fruit he's talking about here is the fruit of love. And as the fruit of love is there, people will know there's something different about this person. She loves like no one I know loves. He loves like no one else I know loves. The love of God is in that person. And Jesus said, that's when people will know that you're my disciple. Number five, if I stay connected to Jesus, I will experience not just some joy, but fullness of joy, full joy. He said, listen, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you 
and that your joy may be complete. God doesn't want us to walk with our heads down and in despair. The Father wants us to walk in joy. It's that deep inner sense of all is well. All is well. There's this contentment inside me. And you know what? The, the enemy might try to take everything away from me. It doesn't matter. There's a contentment inside of me that he can't take away. There's great joy. There's abundance of joy. It's one of the fruit that's produced when we stay connected to the vine, Jesus. Again, in light of all this, staying connected to Jesus, friends, is not an option. It's a necessity. So, so let's, just, let's just close our time together by looking at just two very practical ways that we can, two very practical ways that we can stay connected to Jesus, that we can actually stay and abide in Christ. There's three very practical ways that we can stay connected. So I stay connected, number one, by knowing Jesus better tomorrow than I do today. See, the Christian life begins to grow and continues to grow. It starts and it continues to grow with our knowing and trusting Jesus, a person, the great I am, right? Jesus said this to his father in John 17 in his high priestly prayer. He said this in verse number three. Now this is eternal life. Now all of us want eternal life and many of us have experienced that eternal life that comes through Christ. Again, I've said this many times. It's not just a a quantity of life in heaven, but it's a quality of life on this earth, the abundant life that he talks about. He says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The key word there is that they may know you, that they may know you. And as we enter into that relationship through our knowledge and the grace of Christ, right? Then we grow in that grace. We grow in that knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We come to love him more and more, and that's staying connected to him. When we stay connected to him, we continue. So I'm going to love him. If I'm connected to him, I'm going to love him more tomorrow than I did yesterday. I'm going to love him more today than I did yesterday. I'm going to love him more tomorrow than I do today, right? As we grow in that knowledge, look at the way that the message paraphrase says it in, in 2 Peter chapter 1. One verses one and three says this grace and peace to you many times over as you deepen in your experience with God and Jesus our master. Everything that goes into a life of pleasing God has been miraculously given to us by getting to know personally and intimately the one who invited us to God, the best invitation we ever received. The better we know him, the more we will love him. So knowing Jesus better tomorrow than I do today will keep me plugged in, will keep me connected, and it'll also be proof that I'm connected. Here's a second practical step. I stay connected by loving Jesus more today than I did yesterday. I loved him when I came to know him, but it was a immature love. But as I continue to grow, as I stay connected with him, that immature love becomes a very mature love, a love that is not based on feelings, a love that is not based on circumstances. It is a love that is based on who he is. It's a love that is based on my relationship with him. It is a steady love. It is an uncompromising love. In verse nine, he says, I loved you as the father loved me. Now remain in my love. The first letter that John writes, same writer of the gospel, in verse number 16 of chapter 4, he says this. He says, God is love. And the one who remains in, in love remains in God, and God remains in him. Isn't that awesome? God is love. God is love. And so if I am connected to Jesus, and the way I stay connected is I grow in my knowledge of him, I continue to know who he is, and I will love him more Today than I did yesterday, I love him more tomorrow than, than I do today. And here's the third thing. I stay connected to Jesus by obeying him every day, by obeying him every day. He said this in verse 15, if you love me, you will obey my commands. If you love me, the proof of your love for me is that you will obey my commands. Now, that word obey kind of irritates some people at times. 
maybe you had a strict child childhood, you know, with a lot of discipline in it and, and you were forced to obey and you hurt, you hate that word obey. Maybe, maybe you grew, you had a, a religious, a legalistic religious upbringing and, and all you ever heard were the, were the rules that you had to keep and, and the things you couldn't do and the things you could do. Maybe it's just a natural rebellion of the sim, of the sinful human heart that all of us are born with. But there's something about that word obey that sometimes brings a negative connotation with it. And here's the deal. Sometimes we obey because we have to, right? I mean, there are some laws that I keep not because I want to, not because I necessarily like them, but I do because I have to obey them, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, setting aside our, our own plans and learning to obey is one of the essential tasks. You know, the, the biggest difference between childhood and adulthood is that the child obeys because he has to, but he gets to the point where he obeys because he wants to, right? And sometimes we obey because we, there's a reward in sight. And I know as parents, we, you know, how many times do we say, okay, if you do this, this is what I'm going to give you. If you sit there still at the end of this time, this is what we're going to do. And I'll take you to get, you know, DQ ice cream or whatever. And there's a reward in that. So sometimes obedience is, is motivated by reward. But here's the best way to obey. This is the, 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 ultimate, the ultimate motivation for obedience. It's not because I have to. It's not because there's some kind of reward that's waiting for me. The greatest motivation, the reason for, for loving is because I want to love. It is motivated by love. It is motivated by, not by fear, not by greed. It is motivated by my love for the person I'm obeying. In this, in this sense, it's Jesus. See, abiding in Christ is inseparable from obeying Christ. Because the quickest way to damage our communion with Jesus is to disobey his word. It makes it very difficult for him to bless us the way he wants to bless us when we are walking in disobedience to, to him and his word. I wanna read just some quick scriptures for you just so you get the feel for what I'm talking about here. John 15, 10. Jesus says, I have obeyed my father's commands and I remain in his love. In the same way, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. 1 John 2, 3 through 6. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. John 14, 23, Jesus says, If people love me, they will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, he, and he, we will come to them and make our home with them. And then verse 21, Those who know my commands and obey them are the ones who love me. And my Father will love those who love me. I will love them and will show myself to them. So let, let, me, let me just sum it up this way. The better we know Jesus, the more we're gonna love him. The more we love him, the more we're going to obey him. The more we obey him, the more we will abide in him. The longer we abide in him, the longer we're connected to him, the more fruit we will bear. The more fruit we bear, the more we will experience the eternal life, the abundant life, that he wants you and I to experience, not just in heaven, but on this earth as well. So in closing, let me just, let me just say this. Imagine for just a moment how our life would change, how our families would change, how our community would change if every one of us, if each of us would make it our day's mission to daily cultivate our relationship with Jesus to the point that our love will grow deeper and deeper with each passing day. That the fruit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness and self-control would be on such display that no one would be able to deny it, the fruit that we're bearing. My question in closing is this, do you want to live a life of purpose and significance. All of us want that. But here's the deal. 
It doesn't happen by trying harder. It happens by staying continually connected to the vine, by growing in our love, our knowledge, our love, the grace of the person who said this, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. What's the truth? The truth is this, that staying connected to Jesus is not an option. It's a necessity. It's a necessity. So here's the questions. Here's some questions. What's your relationship like with the vine today? On this very morning, what is your relationship with the vine? When you look at your life, do you look at it and see it as one that it's cultivating, that's remaining in him? Are you bearing fruit? When he prunes you, how do you respond? Do you get angry? Do you shake your fist at him? Or do you recognize it's the Father? He's good. He can't help but be good. He's love. He can't help but be love. And whatever he allows to come into my life is because he is cultivating something even better and greater for the future. And as the worship team leads us in the next song, closing our time together, why don't you spend some time communing with the Lord? Just spend time loving Him and telling Him how much you love Him. Maybe today you find yourself disconnected and you need to reconnect. Man, you, at one time you used to walk with Jesus, but you're so far from Him now. And the things of this world appeal so much to you and the things of God have been forgotten and set aside. Maybe today as I was reading the Word and and, and, and teaching the word, you realize, and the Holy Spirit made you realize that you have started drifting and you're starting to see the signs of withering. Why don't you commit yourself afresh today? Why don't you reconnect in repentance and say, Jesus, I want to know you. I want to love you in a deeper way, more than I've ever have. Maybe you're watching today and you're good. You're growing, man, you have remained in him and he remains in you and, and you just say, Lord, I, I thank you. I thank you for your love that it's not me, it's you. You're the one that has drawn me to you and, and because I'm in you, I'm able to produce this fruit. It's because of you, Jesus. And you just wanna say, Lord, I wanna remain in you. I, I wanna stay, I wanna dwell in your presence. I wanna allow you to produce more fruit in my life. If you have to prune me, if you have to bring a little pain, God, that's okay, because I know it's gonna be for my good and for the good of those that my fruit is gonna bless. Just let him know how much you love him. You join us right now, right where you are. Just, just enter in as the worship team leads us in worship.
cold, I am healed, I am whole, I am saved in Jesus' name. Highly favored, anointed, filled with your power for the glory, Jesus' name. Father, thank you so much for your presence in our lives. Thank you for the invitation that you have given us today, Jesus, of abiding in you, of remaining in you. Thank you, Lord, that it's nothing to do with us, but you are the one that pursued us. You're the one that pursues us. You're the one that goes after us. You're the one that draws us to yourself through your love and mercy, compassion. When I look at what you did for us, God, on that cross, when I see and recognize the fact that that while I was yet a sinner, you died for me. And Jesus, there are many that need to surrender their life to you, Father, and I pray that they would do so even now 
that they would simply pray a prayer of repentance and confession of sin and turn turn from their ways and turn to your ways, oh God, that they could be connected to you and begin to remain and abide in you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your incredible love. My God, I pray that you would at all times help us to realize those moments, God, when we perhaps begin to drift and that we would not drift too far before we run back to your open arms and allow you to work in our hearts and lives. Thank you for loving us. The only reason that we can love you is because you first loved us. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Well, will you stand with me? Or perhaps you can do it while you're sitting down. But let's go ahead and and make our stand declaration and conclude our time together in the name of Jesus. I will not bow down to the spirit of this age. I will stand united with my brothers and sisters in one spirit and one passion. Trusting in God alone, I will stand out, stand true, stand strong, and stand firm in my faith, letting nothing move me. Amen and amen. I love y'all. We'll see you tomorrow. What an incredible word that was this morning. I know it blessed you. We encourage you to go back and check out any messages you may have missed over the past few weeks uh, during this series. And We are so glad that you were with us today online. We know that we'll be together soon. We hope that you have a great week.